I'm continuing my video series on ancient atmospheric energy and illumination. This is part 2 of the series. If you feel like you've missed anything, check out the previous video, the link is in the description. I recommend watching it to get the full picture. Without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. Ancient Atmospheric Energy and Illumination Part 2 Paris is known as the City of Lights because it was the first to use gas lighting in the late 1800s. I did a search query on 1700s Paris and found plenty of images of Paris, but none at night. So, I added night to the search query and still found nothing. Was that because Paris was in darkness? No. In the previous episode we saw France had a long tradition of illumination. And if they weren't using the wireless tech, at the very least the city was lit up by lanterns. And yet, I found not one painting of nighttime Paris from the 1700s. This, to me, points at deliberate censorship. I guess we're supposed to believe that the Parisians built castles, palaces, bridges, towers and cathedrals, far superior to anything we're capable of building today, but didn't have the means to light them up at night. Some say ancient illuminations are powered by mercury. I found a webpage on StolenHistory.net, titled Atmospheric Electricity. The following old articles are taken from the page. Pause this video if you want to read it. The page contains more examples. I don't know enough to comment either way. What I know is that Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, fought legal battles with other inventors, including Nikola Tesla, who did propose wireless technologies apt from the air. Through the funding machinery of the Rockefeller family, Edison finally beat his competitors, and today we all pay for electricity. The Wikipedia page on Mercury is quite illuminating, for once. I quote. Quantities of liquid mercury ranging from 90 to 600 grams have been recovered from elite Maya tombs or ritual caches at six sites. In Islamic Spain, it was used for filling decorative pools. The Fresnel lenses of old lighthouses used to float and rotate in a bath of mercury. Calomel, or mercurous chloride, has been used in traditional medicine as a diuretic, topical disinfectant, and laxative. Mercuric chloride, or corrosive sublimate, was once used to treat syphilis, along with other mercury compounds, although it is so toxic that sometimes the symptoms of its toxicity were confused with those of the syphilis it was believed to treat. It is also used as a disinfectant. Blue mass, a pillar syrup in which mercury is the main ingredient, was prescribed throughout the 19th century for numerous conditions, including constipation, depression, childbearing and toothaches. In the early 20th century, mercury was administered to children yearly as a laxative and duomer, and it was used in teething powders for infants. The mercury-containing organohalide merbermin, sometimes sold as mercurochrome, is still widely used, but has been banned in some countries such as the United States. 140 countries agreed in the Minamata Convention on Mercury by the United Nations Environment Program to prevent emissions. The convention was signed on 10 October 2013. The Minamata Convention on Mercury is an international treaty designed to protect human health and the environment from anthropogenic emissions and releases of mercury and mercury compounds. The convention was a result of three years of meeting and negotiating, after which the text of the convention was approved by delegates, representing close to 140 countries, on 19 January 2013 in Geneva, and adopted and signed later that year on 10 October 2013, at a diplomatic conference held in Kumamoto, Japan. The convention is named after the Japanese city Minamata. This naming is of symbolic importance, as the city went through a devastating incident of mercury poisoning. I learned that mercury had a wide variety of uses in industry and medicine. It is in fact related to the illumination of ancient lighthouses and pyramids of the Maya. But now it's banned in most countries to prevent poisoning. I could name more toxic substances that aren't banned. Why is mercury singled out? While investigating, I came across an e-booklet titled Atmospheric Energy, a retrospective, published by StolenHistory.net. You can download it there. I don't vouch for the truth of its contents, but it's a fascinating read. The author is either very imaginative or has access to some type of elite intel. I'll go into some of it. The author says a substance called red gold or Arab gold is responsible for AET or atmospheric ether technology. A code word for mercury. The author says that normal gold is used and then mixed with other substances. 
The main reason gold is being hoarded by the elite, the author says, is to keep this tech out of the hands of normal people. I've heard it said that the technology is withheld because it can cause great damage. But, the argument could be made that the only damage it causes is to the greedy elite. The book says, the world center of red gold production in the old days, was Hazer, Turkmenistan. That would have made it the most protected place on earth. Is that why even today, Turkmenistan is perceived as closed off and secretive? I snooped around the area on Google Earth a little, and found one of the mysterious ancient grids in the desert. I'm not saying it's related. But where we find real ancient centers of power, we always also find desert, because they these locations were, in my view, pulverized by bombs and advanced weaponry from the air. An interesting claim from the booklet. Supplying energy to residential and industrial buildings was based on completely different principles than it is today. AET, as the name suggests, used the now forgotten principle of gathering and concentrating energy from the atmosphere. This energy was called atmospheric energy, or atmospheric electricity, which in turn varied from traditional electricity. Technically, it involved the construction of a building that had special components in its structure. This components gathered energy from the atmosphere and channeled it through the building's metal frame. Theoretically, there was no limit to power output that could be gained from the atmosphere. Practically, it depended on geographic latitude of the place where the building stood, the size of energy conducting components of the building, and terrain features. Some sources claim that throughout the world, there were cities that were built with atmospheric energy extraction in mind, where each house was getting its share of energy, while simultaneously providing energy for general public need, such as lighting streets at night. The most fascinating assertion, to me, was that there were ships utilizing atmospheric energy. This is from the booklet. It reminded me of ancient paintings of flying ships. If you say, nah, come on, that's fiction. I say. Mythology is full of flying ships. All the so-called gods of ancient times were using flying devices. If the ancients were able to harness energy from the air, what would stop them from using it to drive and fly? If the ancients harnessed free energy, it would explain why the layouts of so many ancient cities look like circuits, as previously shown. Did this video push the boundaries of thought? Did you enjoy it? As this type of information is being suppressed, you can help by sharing this video and others like it. Knowledge dissemination relies on you. Share this video far and wide.